All right, Henry. Thanks for thanks for joining me. I appreciate that you uh, decided to do this interview with me because I'm trying to figure out, as a union member myself, what's going on with our union. As a as a retiree, I feel like I've been completely forgotten and discarded by our union, and I'm I'm trying to figure out how can we as union members get some new spirit into our union because a lot of us me included are very frustrated with uh, with the way things are going and how do we what are we going to do to try to get some new blood in <laughs> into our union and i know that you're you're interested in this so if you have any, can you give us give me any what do we do henry <laughs> <laughs> well first off i mean one thing we have to stop and this I take personal issue with because it happened to me. When a member comes in, new new person with the company, decides, hey, we want to be part of this company. Well, the spiel from the union should always be, what can your union do for you? Not, well, you don't have any representation into the end of probation. Yeah. Well, in between that, what are you offering me? We're going to take your money. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you want to be anti-union, that's what you do. Well, we need to build relationships from the beginning of their tenure, from the start of their hire date to the time they retire. We need to start rebuilding that trust between new hire, 10-year uh, guy, 20-year guy, 40-year guy, and retiree. Currently, we're not doing that. Because mm -hmm. nobody asked you how did that ten percent feel when you when you lost in your medical? Yeah. Well, we didn't nobody get any votes. We, we were well, to did anybody tell you? Did anybody inform you? Yeah. If fourteen people say that this is a good thing. Right. You're you're referring to the to the extra board, uh, not the extra board, the this executive board, executive who voted fourteen to four to put this forward, yes. and we didn't get any more feedback other than that. Yes. The yeah. gag orders do that. Right, right. That's that's odd. This whole union secrecy stuff. Uh, I well, take the, well, the thing is, if you knew about it, would you have stood up and said, "Look, this is not fair. This is not fair as a retiree on a fixed income that since 2009 you lost 20 percent of your medical. 20 percent. I, mean, I lost 20 percent of my gross pay is what I lost. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, you know, but that's part of your pension yeah. and everything rolled into it. Right. Well, I lost my, you know, I got 950 a month gross. I was supposed to get my that plus my medical. That's when I retired out. I thought in my mind, I'm going to get my 950 a month plus my medical. What ended up yeah. happening is, I got my 950 a month, but I have to take out 188 dollars of that every month to pay to pay for the medical. It's, it's Northwest Florida. <laughs> You have to take out $188 of that 950, which leaves me, you know, 780 or whatever it is. That's a 20% reduction. That was not the deal that I or anybody else who retired when I did or before had. Right. They lied to us yes. about what we were going to have. But again, the promise was made to you when you were, you decided to retire. If you knew what you know now, right. would you retire well, that's 15 a, years, that's or you would have you know, hung in for another that's 20? That's true, exactly. I don't know if I would have hung in. I, I, I <laughs> hated you. it. But I, the average person I, might, have, I, might have decided, yeah, well... Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah you're but right. it was, it was, it's called choice. Right. But we the thing we is, when you retire, you leave the union in good standing. Then you expect good stewards of your union. Yeah. This is what you guys work for. This is what us who have to look forward, not back, we have to look forward. So we have to keep moving forward. And currently we're not moving forward. And that's, what do you think about, can you rebuild solidarity? Is there any way to do that? Yes. It's going to take about maybe a year. And that's, a, that's, a year. that's just a small estimate. But first off, when a person comes into the union hall, we should be offering the steward program along with their orientation. The steward, we need good stewards because we talk. I talk about frontline all the time. You know, in my writings, I always say frontline worker. Well, we need frontline workers out there. We need at least one for 15 new new hires that come in, or 15 people that are out there, because there's three types of training: your initial training as bus operators. You have your initial training, then you have your line training. And then what's your third? 
Um, there is no third. Right. There. So when you come in and say, okay, well, I'm just going to keep my head down and make sure I don't, I don't mess up. But there should be somebody there for you. Yeah. Somebody should be able to help you write the reports. Oh, I see. That's a, that's a steward. Almost like a big brother. Yes. <laughs> Somebody to hold your hand as you're going. That's a great idea. Yeah. Actually. But the thing is, we don't promote our stewardship. It's just a right. just something on a piece of paper hanging on the board right. that nobody really looks at. Right. You're right. But if you ask yourself this on your union boards, shouldn't you have that information on there? Should you have your wine garner rights on there? Do you even know what your your shop steward looks like if you have one? Do you even know what your uh, executive board member look like? Yeah, you do if you get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the management is the one calling you union rep. Yeah. Tell you, hey, you got to, you know, make sure you take it with your union rep if they're nice. Yeah. But the thing is, is this stuff on our union board? The answer is no. Why is it not? You know, nobody told me about the wine garner rights. Really? Nobody. I learned that from a manager. You're, of course, I knew about my... Wine garden, right? <laughs> I needed them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know I needed them myself until a manager told me. Yeah, I hear and you. And that, that should be coming from my union, bro. Do you think Harry Support is doing a good job? Well, if you say safety and security is a, a priority with the company, Ask somebody who's gotten assaulted. Ask them what the SOP is for an assault. What is it? There isn't any. Oh. That's right. But do you know the SOP for a, a preventable accident? I don't remember. Okay. You, you either you pull off the bus, you're sent back to the garage, you write your report, you either take a UA if necessary, and you're sent home with pay. Mm -hmm. So which one is more important? Oh, that's interesting. The essential worker or a piece of equipment that can be replaced. That's this person can be replaced. But if you say somebody comes up to you and spits in your face and per dispatch, I wouldn't say unwritten rule that their manager decides, okay, well, if a person is assaulted, you need to keep that machine going. Well, what if the person is white knuckling it all the way to the end of the line? They're dealing with post traumatic stress. Right. But if you ask you, your union head, and they say, well, it should be the operator's choice, I beg to disagree. Because being in that situation myself, being left out there, you know, that type of situation is pretty bad. Yeah. Because I was not confident. I, I, you know, I sit here and listen to the dispatch, uh, TriMet dispatch for hours at a time sometimes, and it's always amazed me that something traumatic will happen to the operator, and the operator is not relieved right there. No. There, that should, I, what you're saying is it should be a policy. You have a traumatic, you're relieved until yeah, you, you're, you just, you just sit you're, you're off for the rest of the day. Yes. That's right, and if you have what's called a preventable, I see what you're saying, but yeah. the preventable accident. There, it's in they right. take you off the bus, they test you, they send you home, but not yeah. for the assault. Yeah, that's a good point. And but that's that's major because you're, yes. you're that's, Why sending a mess well, that's sending a message to yeah. the employee that you don't really matter. pieces of equipment. Yeah. We're not just some people that are here to, that are lucky to have a job as, uh, right. to quote somebody is saying, we're, we're more than that, we're professionals. When you, you put us out there, we are the face of the company as the general manager has stated. We are the face of the company, so we should act accordingly, but we should be respected as well. Yeah. You know, professionalism isn't just a one-way street. You know, they their expectations of us are up here. Management should be up here as well. Currently, it's not. Do you think our union ATU 757 has been doing a good job in the media? And do they, do they, are we represented well in the media? <sighs> Let's say if you go out and 
talk about having an open negotiation. And then, you know, make a big rah-rah about it, and then all of a sudden you, you go away and do a gag order. Or if you go out and put your information on circulars, you know, with the various newspapers, and talk about retirees as, you know, we're fighting for the retirees. And then your situation, under 65, congratulations, you got this percentage, but that's not what you were promised when you retired. So if you're going to throw people under the bus, why are you putting them in new newspapers? Or if you remember uh, Brother Bob's video uh, concerning the retirees, really good piece that, that was put on YouTube. Uh, somebody had to argue with our current representation to put it on the HU.org uh, site. Sis June, a TriMet retiree's wife. Because of health care benefits promised through her husband's retirement from TriMet, she has survived an aneurysm, two bouts with cancer, and a 12-day stay in the hospital for pneumonia. Okay, Henry, can you talk a little bit about the systemic problems of TriMet, the things that happen to operators every day and TriMet's uh, response and what you think would be the appropriate response? Well, first off, we have a problem with our fare system. Uh, anytime you disproportionately affect riders by adding a 40 cents or 50 cents increase in their fares, that leads to problems in the system, especially when our our SOPs are so gray on uh, how do we determine a proper fare. Now, we're trained to be an informer. Well, you read the SOP, it's so much gray area, so if you have 1,900 people making 1,900 different decisions in the systems, you're going to have confusion. And a study that was printed out in 2011, I believe, stated that if there's confusion in the system, that always leads to regression. And especially if the company has decided to move away from, you know, social programs such as AK Rutgers or reaching out to the, the people that they serve, that creates more problems, like a disconnect from the company. So I think if we solve those problems, we can actually make this system a safer system, a well-respected system, where there's not so much operator assaults or the public getting informed about the operator assaults because that gets swept under the rug quite a bit. What do you think about what, what do you think about the uh, fair inspections, the way they handle the fair? These what I call the fair Nazis. Um. <laughs> well, it, it ain't what it used to be. Put, <laughs> put it that way, where they had a classification of fair inspectors. But you know, to be honest, it could be better. Uh, the first, first off. Uh, take Pam Thompson for instance. Uh, love Sister Thompson. The fact is, why is it that she got assaulted over a 50 cent fare? What should she have done? What should she be taught on how to properly administer fares? You could put up this sticker, that sticker, and then say, well, you're an informer. Well, are you an informer or are you an enforcer? I know some of my brothers and sisters are confused with this conundrum because the company has created a gray area. You know, we need to have a standard. How do you administer, administer fares properly so that we don't have confusion in the system? Why do you think TriMet's not clear about that? Because instead of having a fair enforcement system like they used to have with the fare inspectors, now they put it all on the operators. But then when you have a 50 cent hike in fares, you know, they're not calling the company and saying, look, you know, these fares are unfair to me because I'm on a fixed income or I'm retired. I can't afford it now. Or you just divorce yourself from the situation, such as with A.K. Rucker's uh, program that was running for years. You know, now they disconnected with transit equity problems. Don't they have some kind of a... I, what is it, internship thing they do in the summer? I, 
I saw something that had some kind of a. Well, if it is, it's not associated with what Rucker program right. represented. Well, they kind of took it away from the frontline employees and put it in with management. With like the management runs the Oh, program. yes. You know, yes you I know, remember that. Yeah. I remember that. What, I always uh, called them propagandists. You know, they were trained <laughs> to spread positive climate propaganda. Right. Whereas Rucker's program actually was more based toward the kids and yeah. helping the kids. Um, I don't know, I mean, but again, if you want to want to say, well, we want to build relationships with disadvantaged kids, or do we want to put them in a in an internship and pushing papers? Have you ever met John L. Bell? No. Like to one day. Yeah. Interesting fellow. Yeah, I had a conversation. Nice guy. But he's he works for McFarland, so <laughs> if you work for McFarland, you're under the constraints of McFarland, and that's what. He's facing. I understood. Uh, I'm sure he does a pretty good job. Although I've seen well, I videos, I've seen the board meetings with his presentations. Very well run. Yeah, but I don't know. Again, I we're, we're, we're not behind the curtain, no. so we don't know. Yeah, the transit equity thing. I, I personally, I think it's a complete farce, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>why things were the way they are, but I, I didn't find it satisfactory. Can you can you go over the process that led to this ratification? Um, something about 14 executive board members voted yes and only four voted no, but there was a gag order of some sort? Can yeah. I'm not, I don't know if we're clear about that. <laughs> Tell us about that. Do you know what you <laughs> well, <want? laughs> well, the gag order was put in place so that uh, the company couldn't come back in and say, uh, you're tampering unfair labor practice, you know, liability for the union. You know, so that was put in place for that very reason. But the simple fact is there's no transparency. There's zero transparency because the lack of information getting out uh, leads us as members to make decisions based on somebody's opinion. You know, such as the 50 plus 1 vote that's going to come up in March. If you, don't, if you have the wrong information that isn't properly vetted, just like the tentative agreement wasn't properly vetted before it was given to members, members are making decisions based on somebody's opinion, not the actual fact. Uh, Chris Day brought up this very fact that the 50 plus 1 does not violate international bylaws. And the executive board took an opinion from our soon to be gone, I don't know what you call her, but Susan Stover. She was she's gone, you know, March first, but she put out the information. It wasn't properly vetted. They made Rob Halman, who presented it in front of the executive board to be, you know, adjudicated by the membership, he got blasted mm -hmm. on information that was just an opinion, not actual fact. So when, when Brother Day came up and said, No, 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 no you have to redo this because the information that you provided was inaccurate as far as the status quo of how we do things you've been through it I see it happening you know in in our current administration our past administration there's no accountability do we know who voted for or against this tentative agreement right, we why 14 people thought that seniority for the mechanics was worth a dollar or the fact that you take out the grandfather clause and throw you guys under the bus. You also have to remember that 500 people did not vote or abstain from voting. That's yeah. a major No, no, it was like more like 900. It's like half the people voted. Yeah. If, and the retirees got no vote. Yeah, yeah. but if you, if you said uh, the voting block, yeah. you know, people said yay, who was in the majority, and people who said nay, just a little less. Just a little less. Yeah. You know, I think probably within 100, maybe 200 yeah. votes. But the fact is, 500 people didn't vote or abstain. Right. Those are the those are the people who were, I want to say, new hires or new members. 
You know, they got no information. All they got was a tentative agreement that wasn't properly vetted mm -hmm. and put out there in front of everybody and said, well... And that's the other problem I have with the union is that there is no... Wait, they make a decision and no dissent allowed. I, right. mean, I know they sent John Hunt into a corner. John and Mary had to go into a corner and pretend that they didn't exist while this was going on. Uh, well, that's, that's all speculation because with the gag order, you don't even know that, for instance. It's all rumors. Well, there was a gag order. Yes. So who's the gag order directed at? <laughs> all the executive board members from talking about it. Yeah. So I mean, how can or how can we exist in a situation? You can't talk about. I mean, what kind of that that is just. Well, you don't run a campaign and say you're the transparency guy when everything has been shady at best, and that's being oh. that's being kind. You, know, you can't say. Or for instance, something uh, Brother Dave brought up. Well, where's the accountability? Do you know who voted for what? And why is it that it's a secret on how people voted? Or say um, one of one of our brothers out at West wanted to be a liaison, you know, for, for the union. Instead of calling over to Merlo and say, well, can you help me out over here? You know, there's the situation that we need to handle. Well, why not make him the liaison? He knows everything about West. And then they say, well, it, it was voted down. Well, what was the number? Well, we can't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I mean, really. You know, where's the accountability? Yeah. That's you know, it's, the way the system is, is right now, the status quo is meant to discourage members yeah. from participation. Yeah, that's right. Which needs to go away. So what do you think the attitude of the, uh, the president should be regarding the members? Well, the president should always have a leader's or uh, a member's first uh, approach, which means that we need to re-empower our members. Because a lot of times our, our members are just out there and they're just, they're just dumbfounded about what's going on. And then when somebody who's active gets out there and starts talking about it, ask them what their opinion is about the union. What do they think? they see that may be wrong uh, with the union or how can the union better serve them there's no there's no conversation about that it's just you're expected to do it you're expected to pay us and it's all anti-union it's all anti-union <laughs> rhetoric yeah because <laughs> if you look at it you're just making their point for them I mean you can't just say we're a union and and mean it with any substance when you don't practice anything unionized yeah, you know, just take take for instance the block side of it. Okay, we're talking about something that, again, you sign in secret, you shove it onto the members and say it's a good thing, and then you try to hide certain information so that uh, the chief representative doesn't have any clue about anything, but then you put a PowerPoint present, you know, and tell people, hey, it doesn't affect your seniority. In what world? <laughs> in what world? Yeah, I don't understand how anybody doesn't understand how that is screwed up your soul. But the thing is, you're selling it. You're you're trying to sell it to the membership and say, look, your seniority isn't isn't affected. But that's incorrect because now you just taken all my choices away for a block program that is wrought with all kind of failures. Because my current situation my first piece, I'm off at 2 o'clock. By Friday, I'm off at 7 o'clock. So you see my body clock is set here at 2 o'clock. By the time I'm done, I'm off at 7 o'clock. So my body's used to getting off at 2 o'clock. So you just affected my sleep, my recovery, my mental recovery, especially if we're trying to be behind the seat for X amount of hours, we have to be on top of our game. If we're not on top of our game, we're just, we're flying sleep. Yeah. We're just sleeping. And it's not a good thing. No, but that's, you know, that's what Mr. Rose was trying to uh, prove with his, uh, <laughs> his hours of service. <laughs> yes, the hours of service. Though.